Hey guys, time for another TikTokers Q&A. So uh, for anyone who doesn't actually uh, follow me on TikTok or know what this is, um, this is just a bunch of questions from uh, TikTok, my TikTok account, um, where I just, it's a little easier for me to uh, respond to them on YouTube because I'm not uh, restricted to three minute little chunks. So I've got a bunch of really interesting questions here. Um, yeah, for you YouTube guys, uh, for my YouTube audience, I'll be happy to do this again on YouTube. Maybe we can do a live stream uh, where you guys can ask me questions directly as well. Let me know if you'd be interested in that if you are not a TikTok follower, if you just uh, find find me on YouTube. So uh, we've got some really awesome questions here. Obviously, a lot of stuff on uh, Ukraine and a bunch of other things. So let's see the first one. Uh, what's my prediction about the end of the Russia-Ukraine war? Uh, there's an awful lot of uncertainty here, if I'm honest. So I think the Ukrainians will win. I think this will be a... The Ukrainian strategic victory. I think the Russians will not be able to hold on to the gains they currently have unless they escalate to a level at which they've shown themselves unwilling to uh, escalate to at the minute. So that would require a declaration of war on Ukraine and uh, a general mobilization of the Russian military. Now, Vladimir Putin has shown that he is unwilling to do that uh, thus far, and I think it's quite unlikely he will do that in future. The reason why is he probably doesn't want to impose an even greater level of sacrifice on the Russian elite or the Russian general public for fear of destabilizing his regime. So given that that's probably quite unlikely to happen, or at least uh, I don't see, I don't see how the Russians can hold onto the ground they've taken as their peacetime army gets just whittled down and attrited over time. And, uh, you know, the Ukrainians end up becoming better and better equipped while the best Russian equipment is being destroyed and it's being replaced with uh, older stuff from Russian or Soviet stockpiles. So uh, given that that seems to be the trajectory we're on and the fact that Ukraine has fully mobilized and is now getting uh, yeah, some very fancy Western equipment, uh, I think you know we will have the grounds for a large scale Ukrainian counteroffensive uh, happening pretty soon once you know the culmination of the um, the Donbass battle. It's, uh, you know, I don't think the Ukrainians have actually deployed the majority of their forces to uh, the Donbass to defend the place. I think they're holding quite a lot in reserve. One of the reasons why I would come to this conclusion is uh, if you just have a look at their counteroffensive around Kharkiv and how effective that has been, um, where they've actually driven the Russians back to the Ukrainian border in several places. So um, there are also a few noises made by uh, US intelligence and, and people like that saying, uh, that they think the Ukrainians will be ready for a counteroffensive in the coming months. Given that balance of forces and given that trajectory we've been on, I don't see how the Russians win this. Basically, it almost looks as though the war, if the war was ever winnable, I mean, maybe the conventional phase was winnable very early, but basically, you know, when the, the initial Russian offensive really failed to cause a collapse in the Ukrainian political system and the Ukrainian military, the war was essentially unwinnable from that point onwards. Maybe a minor victory is all the Russians could realistically hope for. That is getting less and less likely as time goes on. So uh, really, I think the, the Ukrainians will win a military victory, I think, a general military victory, not just a defensive one. I think they will uh, unleash a uh, yeah, large-scale counteroffensive that will drive the Russians out of the south of the country. Now, what does the peace deal look like? I just don't know. I honestly don't know. Is Vladimir Putin still in power? That's a real live question, I think, as to whether he remains in power. You know, I don't know. There's going to have to be a negotiated settlement here in some way, shape or form. Uh, but I don't think the Ukrainians should stop fighting until they've driven the Russians uh, at least back to the antebellum uh, positions of uh, 2021, at the very least, before you know everyone signs a... Um, you know, some kind of ceasefire. But uh, yeah, eventually this is going to have to be uh, settled by negotiation because neither side is really strong enough to catastrophically defeat the other. The Ukrainians aren't going to invade Russia. <laughs> you know, they're not going to march on Moscow. That's not realistic. The Russia's nuclear capability would prevent them from doing so anyway. And uh, the Russians have basically, we've already seen that the Russians lack the strength to conquer Ukraine. So that means that we're going to have to have a, a settlement at some point. However, I'm really unsure as to what that settlement would look like. But I think it's probably most likely that we'll, the Ukrainian borders of 2021 will be restored. So next question. Uh, how could the US have won in Vietnam, won the war in Vietnam? And what was their best chance? So I'm not sure that they, that they could have. 
really won the Vietnam War. Really in Vietnam, they there were a lot of similarities to Afghanistan because in Vietnam, they weren't simply fighting the North Vietnamese. They weren't fighting a Soviet proxy. They were actually embroiled in a Vietnamese civil war, which was also a war of national uh, independence. I think one of the fundamental mistakes of the Vietnam War, the miscalculations that drove you know, the United States, but you have to remember it was US allies as well. Australia was in you know, Vietnam, so was South Korea. You know, the Western intervention in the war and the escalation was a fundamental miscalculation that really what this war was, was a, a piece of the wider struggle with global communism. That really what was being defended there was a, a Soviet or a Chinese proxy, Soviet proxy really, um, that was looking to extend the influence of the communist world. When really, for average Vietnamese people, this was simply an anti-colonial struggle, a struggle for national independence. And that fundamental miscalculation is, I think, what led to defeat, uh, ultimately, and uh, really what made the war quite unwinnable, because the amount of commitment that the Vietnamese people had to the conflict far outweighed the political commitment of the Western powers. Like, the Vietnamese people endured, what, over a million dead and kept fighting, and, you know, Western governments lost a bit over 50,000, most of them Americans, 50,000 dead and, uh, you know, had huge resistance to the war effort. So I think that misalignment of national interest explains uh, a lot about the defeat in Vietnam, why it was such a miscalculation to begin with. But the fundamental issue and one of the, you know, from a military perspective, why it was pretty difficult to win the Vietnam War is really the Americans and, you know, their allies could not stay there forever. This is the exact same problem we had in Afghanistan. You have a friendly government that's being propped up by, uh, you know, a Western military presence. However, at some point, that government needs to be able to stand on its own two feet. And, you know, the kind of artificial creation, which was South Vietnam, never really was able to do that. And, uh, you know, as soon as uh, Western military left South Vietnam, yeah, they didn't stand a chance against the North. So I think that was the fundamental reason why the war was unwinnable. And, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the, what military solution could have been applied to South Vietnam to make the South Vietnamese government function properly. Really, there was a, an amount of nation building that was required there that just may not have been possible given the realistic political and economic, um, resources available. Very similar story to Iraq. You know, the, the story of the, def uh, sorry, not Iraq, Afghanistan, the, the story of the Afghan war and the victory, quote unquote, of the Taliban isn't that the Taliban defeated the West militarily. They, they didn't R really, it's a story of the absolute failure of the Afghan government that was put in place after 2001 or 2002 to f govern effectively. I mean, it turned into a corrupt kleptocracy. Really the weakness of the government that, you know, the Western allies were trying to prop up both in South Vietnam and in Afghanistan is the story of probably why those two wars weren't really winnable. So here's a fun one. If I had control over Australia's defense, foreign policy and defense acquisition, what would you pursue? So in terms of the fundamental geostrategy of uh, Australia, I think uh, things are going just fine. I wouldn't necessarily, uh, you know, do anything too different. Obviously, pursuing a closer defense partnership and uh, alliance with the major European powers, such as France uh, and obviously the UK, which is a huge part of the AUKUS arrangement, is a very smart thing and something certainly I would do. I would try and build deeper ties with Germany, but the Germans are, in general, very uncomfortable with operating outside of Europe. But I did hear that the Luftwaffe is going to be deploying to the next uh, pitch black exercise. So for anyone who doesn't know what that is, that's Australia's kind of uh, red flag. Uh, we have a huge air training area in the Northern Territory, and every two years we run Operation Pitch Black, which is a large multinational training exercise. It ends up having hundreds of jet fighters and AWACS aircraft and all that kind of thing. So I think the Germans are actually talking about deploying uh, for the first time typhoons to uh, Australia. So we are seeing a growing, a deepening relationship with the Germans uh, just quietly. I would actually also really pursue deepening ties with the Canadians Canada is one of those friendly nations, really a kindred spirit democracy, member of the Commonwealth, and uh, a very significant power, one that gets eclipsed by the United States a little bit. People tend to think of the Canadians as small and weak because they're, they're always in the shadow of the US, the world's superpower, but Canada is a very significant nation, and uh, they have quite a lot of military potential. It's just 
the Canadians are quite focused on European security, but I would really try and refocus them and try and remind them that they're a Pacific power as well and uh, try and build that relationship. Obviously, the relationship with Japan is a critical one. And really, we're seeing a burgeoning alliance between Australia and Japan that really holds a lot of potential for Australia. You know, Japan, Japan's military industrial complex, its industrial base is really world class. The amount of military technology they produce there um, that really is competitive with world leaders is amazing. So there's lots of opportunities there for collaboration, you know, in the military technological space. Really also though, what we've seen with the reciprocal access agreement being signed not too long ago is a burgeoning alliance between the two countries. Really, the Pacific security architecture has been one that's been defined by something called a hub and spoke system, where the United States is the center of the alliance network and bilateral security uh, alliances really radiate out from the US to the other Western allies in the region. But those allies aren't actually allied with each other in a NATO-like alliance. So really, I think given the rise of China, given the security threat that China poses to the Western powers in the region, we could really look at a much more wider, you know, multilateral alliance. This was tried a long time ago with the uh, CETO, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, which was meant to be like a, an Asian NATO, it just didn't work too well. There was a lot of very divergent powers in there with very divergent interests and it just made the alliance unstable. But if we kept it reasonably small and uh, we really just were talking about core critical US allies, Australia, Japan, potentially South Korea as your, you know, your foundational partners, we could have a, at least a trilateral alliance between Australia, Japan and uh, the United States might make quite a, a good deal of sense. And then expanding that out as a really a bedrock of the future, you know, Asia Pacific security architecture, adding more powers that really are truly ideologically and geopolitically aligned, including external powers like the Europeans as well, if they wanted to join. I think that could make a good deal of sense. Obviously the most, you know, the most important security relationship Australia has is with the United States, but that is going very well. We're all in with the US. We have been for quite a while. AUKUS is really an amazing thing. People focus so much on the submarines, but really AUKUS is, it's, it's a much wider technology sharing agreement that uh, really will align the British, Australian and, you know, American military forces to a, a, technolo a level of technological parity, which will allow them to operate together seamlessly, even more so than they already are capable of. And uh, really that's quite a, quite a good thing for Australia to have access to the US and Britain's military uh, industrial base, both of which are you know, far superior to Australia's. Uh, that helps everyone. It, it allows the United States to uh, share some of its security burden with uh, its most trusted allies around the world, especially in a critical uh, area of the world like the Indo-Pacific. So um, I think that's a great thing. So I, I, there's not too much to change there in terms of the US alliance. Obviously, the Pacific is a critical area of strategic importance to Australia, as we've seen recently, you know, with the Solomon Islands security deal. And then just the other day with the rejection of, you know, the retraction of China's 10 country security pact or development pact. Australia really needs to bring these nations in very close, as close as possible. This is an area of, of critical importance to us. People might wonder why. But the reason it was this area of geography was critical in World War II would be the same reason why it would be critical in any conflict with China. And that is because the sea lines of communication between Australia and the United States run through this area. Just like Japan did in World War II, if you know, China was to go to war with the Western Alliance, one way of defeating Australia would be to isolate it from the United States. So this area of geography will become critical. So it's very important that these island nations really remain within the Australian sphere of influence, if we want to call it that, and uh, really not be wooed by Chinese money. Now, that, in order to do that, we may need to do things like, I, I did read a, um, an interesting proposal that uh, all of these Pacific nations be granted a similar status to New Zealand in you know, basically Australia's legal standing, which would allow Fijian citizens or, or citizens of Kiribati to migrate to Australia without a visa, to travel and work in Australia without a visa. It would also allow essentially a huge free trade block. And this would really integrate these small Pacific nations within the Australian economy even more than they are. On top of that, we really maybe should look towards maybe establishing a military base in a friendly nation in, in uh, the Pacific area. So whether that's Papua New Guinea or maybe Fiji, whoever would be uh, open to that, a joint military facility with the United States would be ideal.
so that's probably something I would you know look into. Uh, yeah, it may be seen as being as an aggressive move, militarizing this area, but I think we're at that stage now. So if we move to the procurement side of things, there's a million things to talk about here. I've also got there's some other questions a little further on, along that also address this this issue here of uh, procurement decisions in the ADF. So uh, if I cover that ground here, I'll uh, yeah I'll assume your question's been answered. So what would I do? What would I pursue? What technologies would I pursue? What capabilities would I pursue? So first thing I would really pursue is I'd have a good, really hard look at ballistic missile defense and uh, what Australia's requirements are. So at the minute, the PLA's ballistic missile arsenal doesn't really pose a major threat to Australia. It's tactical ballistic missiles. They lack the range to really threaten Australia's critical infrastructure. However, that could change reasonably quickly with uh, forward deployment of tactical ballistic missile systems to places like Fiery Cross Reef, for example, would put most of Northern Australia within DF-26 range, or the development of longer range intermediate range ballistic missiles that really would put Northern Australia at risk from launches uh, based in China. So realistically, I think, you know, the Australian mainland may need uh, its own ballistic missile defense complex. I think that's something we really need to look into. It's something that, you know, the Chinese really heavily invest in is ballistic missiles. So that's an area we need to invest in defense. Obviously, that includes hypersonic missile defense. Um, I think there, are, there has been some noises that under the AUKUS pact, the three countries are going to jointly develop a hypersonic defense system. So I'm assuming that's a you know ground-based uh, missile, which will be able to engage hypersonic targets like hypersonic glide vehicles. So that's very important. I really think that needs to be developed, not just for deployed forces, so not just tactically, but strategically as well. One that can defend Australia's air bases, things like JAWN. Um, stuff like that. So that's a very critical capability we should really be looking into. Ballistic missile defense. The question, um, there's another, there's a number of interesting procurement questions going on around the Navy and the Air Force. Another person asked a little later, would a B-21 make sense for the ADF? Now, yes, I actually think it, it would make sense uh, if we had the dollars available. But considering the amount of money we're already talking about spending on defense, upwards of 3% of GDP, perhaps this is achievable. Obviously, this assumes that under the AUKUS arra arrangement, the B-21 would be made available for export. We don't know whether that's possible or not, but, um, you know, look, it wasn't that long ago that the idea of the United States sharing its nuclear submarine reactor technology with Australia was so ridiculously far-fetched that people didn't even consider it a realistic possibility. Yet, we are here now under the AUKUS pact. So, AUKUS may have changed the game when it comes to the B-21. Now, would it make sense to operate a squadron of B-21s in Australia? Yes, I think it would, again, if we could afford it. The capabilities of something like a B-21 provides to a nation like Australia really can't be reproduced by any other kind of platform. Its ability to fly literally to North Asia, unescorted, unrefueled, and then deliver a huge payload of standoff weapons such as the JASSMER would give Australia a massive, a really serious capability. The kind of capability that really would go a very long way to offsetting, you know, China's overall aggregate superiority over the ADF. So just operating 12 of them, just four B-21s could absolutely devastate a naval base. Imagine B-21s operating with LRASMs as an example. Just two or three of them would be able to fly again north of Indonesia and launch dozens of stealth anti-ship cruise missiles at identified uh, naval task groups. This is a devastating capability. It really is. And it's one of the few options that really allow Australia to pose, to hold enemy assets at risk at a very long distance from Australia. It would increase uh, our ability to deter hostile action by actually holding critical infrastructure at risk all the way to mainland China, and its ability to act as a maritime strike platform is amazing. Uh, really is amazing. Like, you could sink a, a carrier battle group with just a, a B-21 strike, absolutely you could. Just the volume of anti-ship cruise missile fire that just, say, four of them could generate. I mean, I, I don't have the actual uh, numbers in front of me. Hang on, I might just go and look it up. So a payload of roughly uh, 30,000 pounds would allow, say, 14 LRASMs per aircraft so a flight of four aircraft 
uh, gives you 60 or so incoming missiles just under. So uh, that is a devastating weight of fire for Australia, you know, a military like the ADF, to be able to generate and uh, strike things like carrier battle groups at a range of, uh, what, 5,000 kilometers from Australia's shores. If you combine that with, uh, obviously, a very pervasive ISR capability, really, this is a very big stick. I mean, Australia invested in the F-111 for a very similar reason. It wanted the ability to deter nations like Indonesia by having the ability to strike them when uh, we really couldn't be struck back. Now, obviously, China has a very large number of long-range strike systems that could pose a significant threat to Australia. And, uh, you know, the government has said, uh, basically, it's their objective of investing in long-range strike systems that can hold uh, PLA assets at risk at a very long range. And nothing will do that better than a B-21. So if we imagine uh, the sale of, say, 14 of these platforms to Australia that could be operated in uh, one squadron, I think that would be a really amazing capability. It would be absolutely ridiculously expensive. But I'm sure, you know, the U.S., if you could add 10% to the size of the USAF's uh, B-21 fleet, that acts in very much the same way as uh, having eight Virginia-class uh, SSNs under uh, Royal Australian Navy service. Uh, really, you're just increasing the USN's capability by 10% or so, a little bit more. So um, I think that would, make, that would be a great idea. It would just be hideously expensive. I don't know how much they cost, a few billion per platform. So we're talking tens of billions of dollars here. It's a shitload of money, possibly as much as the entire F-35 purchase, uh, just going off the top of my head. So if we had the money for that, yes, it would make sense, but there's a lot of unknowns there. So if we move to the Royal Australian Navy now, there's a lot of interesting procurement decisions and discussions going on. So really, there's been quite a lot of discussion about the future of the Hunter class frigate. ASPI released uh, an interesting paper the other day on uh, the Hunter class program, arguing that it should be cancelled in a very similar way to the way AUKUS uh, essentially led to the cancellation of the attack class. Basically, what David Shackleton, the guy who, who wrote this piece for ASPI, argued was that really the the Hunter class was built on a faulty assumption that really what was required was an emphasis on anti-submarine warfare, when really uh, missile defense was more important. And this has led to really a poor choice in terms of Australia's, the RAN's future force structure. Now, what, they, what he argued was that uh, really the Hunter class should be cancelled right now. Uh, Australia should immediately begin negotiations with the United States. The local production of Flight 3 Ali Burks in Australia, uh, nine of them to replace the Anzac class frigate. If that was uh, not to be possible, if those uh, you know negotiations were not fruitful, then he advocated building another four Hobart class destroyers immediately. Really, the whole crux of uh, their argument was that because the Hunter class only has 32 VLS cells, it is really badly underarmed for the kind of missile intense environment that it might will probably end up operating in in uh, the Western Pacific. Basically, in any war with China where Australia will be operating um, in support of the Seventh Fleet, it's very likely that it, you know any RAN assets will have to deal with a very dangerous anti-ship cruise missile threat. To go into that environment underarmed is uh, silly. So that's the crux of the argument. It all kind of focuses on the Hunter class's lack of VLS capacity. So this makes some sense. I, I agree that the Hunter class is underarmed. I think 48 cells really is a bit of a bit of a minimum. Um, however, there are some issues with ASPI's argument. The first is the idea of replacing the Hunter class with the Flight 3 Ali Burke. Now, the Hunter class has a similar displacement to the Ali Burke, but really going beyond that, that's about where their similarities kind of end. One of the major differences between the two is manning. The Ali Burke has roughly twice the personnel of the Hunter class. Now, this is very important for a small navy like Australia, in a place like Australia where wages are very high in the civilian economy, which means it makes retainment and recruitment quite difficult for the navy. So that's the first thing. It, it may be hard, not impossible, but more difficult to man a future fleet where uh, the RAN's uh, primary 
um, ship of the line, if I can use that terminology, is an Ali Burke. Uh, it would double the crewing requirements over the Hunter class. Secondly, over and above just um, the troubles with potentially manning this fleet is the cost. One of the largest costs of running a navy is simply in wages. And, uh, you know, in the Western world, in Australia, uh, people are paid reasonably well, comparatively well compared to a place like China. And that means that uh, if you double the, the, the manning levels in your fleet, you double the wage costs, the personnel costs over the 30 year lifetime of the vessel. And so this becomes a substantial uh, additional cost that ASPI simply had not accounted for at all. So this really needs to be thought about before we start jumping into Ali Burks necessarily. Now, in terms of uh, the Hunter class itself, I'm not necessarily sure that we should be comparing VLS capacity to the United States Navy exclusively, which is essentially the argument that ASPI made. That in comparison to an Ali Burke, uh, Hunter class was desperately underarmed and really would be classified as a minor surface combatant in the US Navy, a little bit like the Constellation class frigate. However, if we look beyond the United States and uh, look at other navies around the world, something like a 48 cell VLS complex is pretty normal. So the Hobart class has 48 cells, the Daring class has 48 cells, and you look in Europe, that is a very normal level of armament. If we compare to the Chinese, which is the primary threat, the Type 52D class destroyer, which is their main destroyer, main modern class of destroyer, is essentially armed in the same way as a Hobart class. It has a few more VLS, but uh, its major um, anti-ship cruise missile is launched via its VLS complex. So in terms of its air defense capacities, it's almost identical to a Hunter class. Now, they, the Chinese are building a much larger cruiser called the Type 55, which is very heavily armed, but really that shouldn't be some, that shouldn't be a standard to compare the Hunter class to. It's a different class of ship. So really, the Hunter class isn't necessarily that poorly armed in comparison to most navies around the world, even the Chinese. Additionally, it may be relatively easy to upgun the Hunter class to 48 VLS cells. Now, the issue that seems to be happening with the Hunter class frigate is its displacement is being blown out by including the CFAR-2 radar, which is uh, the Australian made air search radar, which is actually one of the best maritime air search radars available anywhere in the world. It absolutely should be on all Australian ships. It's performed exceptionally well. And the Aegis combat system. So those two things together have blown out the displacement of the vessel to 10,000 tons. Now the major issue with that over and above this compromising performance of the Hunter class is it may have eaten up a whole heap of room for growth. Usually when you build a warship, you leave a whole heap of buoyancy and stability available for future upgrades, new systems that will take up that weight and space. And one of the unanswered questions about the Hunter class is whether this new bigger Hunter class, which is 10,000 tons, will have any room for growth or whether that room for growth has already been taken up by these, you know, putting in the additional Australian mandated systems. So a lot depends on that. If there is room for growth, it's actually not very difficult to upgun the Hunter class to 48 VLS cells. The thing about the Mark 41 vertical launch system complex, they come in eight cell segments and there are different lengths to, to the cells. So basically the Hobart class has 48 cells that are all uh, strike length, which means they can accommodate things like the LRASM or Tomahawk. Uh, however, you can get a shorter version called a tactical length, and this is much lighter, and this would allow you to still use weapons such as the SM2 and ESSM critically. However, this takes up much less space and weight on the ship. As part of the upgrade called the FFG Up program that was done on the Adelaide class frigates, one of these tactical length Mark 41 VLS segments was placed on the deck of the Adelaide class, which allowed them to field 32 uh, evolved species Sea Sparrow missiles, massively increasing their ability to defend themselves from you know, anti-ship cruise missiles. So really, if there is even a moderate space and weight you know, buoyancy reserve there, it shouldn't be too hard to put in a couple of additional tactical length VLS modules in the Hunter class, even if this means putting them on the deck. Now, Obviously, I'm not an, a naval engineer. I don't know exactly how hard this would be, but given how easy it was to do on the FFG uh, up program on the Adelaides, this really shouldn't be a massive upgrade. 
Uh, again, there seems to be quite a lot of additional room in the forecastle where the current 32 cell VLS complex is. So really, if we could upgrade or upgun the Hunter class to 48 cells, even if two of those eight cell segments were just, you know, they were tactical length, because the RAN focuses so much on the ESSM, there will always be at least 32 ESSMs on every Australian warship, probably more. You know, 64 certainly isn't a, a crazy number. That would make the Hunter class essentially superior to the Hobart class in every way. So it would have a better radar than the Hobart class. It would have the same armament, uh, essentially. It would be much quieter. It would have a much better sonar. It would be a much more modern ship internally as well. So really, I think if you can upgrade the Hunter class and upgun it, you know, this seems to be not worth cancelling the whole program over and wasting even more money like we did on the attack class. Look, I would love an Ali Burke in Australian service. I think that'd be awesome. They're, they have an unparalleled amount of firepower, really, and they're probably the most successful contemporary destroyer design. But I'm not sure it's necessarily worth just cancelling the Hunter class and everything we've gone through thus far. Um, I think there is a decent argument to be made for building more Hobart classes. Again, if the shipyards can handle the work until Hunter comes online. It might even be worth cancelling Hunter class production or postponing it for five years, allowing the design to really mature and instead building another three Hobart classes. That actually makes a great deal of sense. The Hobart is actually a really excellent warship. It is an Ali Burke in miniature and um, you know it's way better than an Anzac. So having more Hobart classes now is probably worth having more Hunter classes later. Yeah, one way or the other, I think the, the Hunter class does need to be upgunned, but if it can be upgunned, I don't see why we should cancel it. In terms of anti-submarine warfare, it is a truly world-class warship. And uh, if you can just get 48 VLS cells on it, that's a very large missile payload when you consider the fact that ESSM can be quad packed. So uh, that doesn't seem to be a deal breaker in my humble opinion. For other stuff, look, I think um, an indigenous satellite recon capability would be very critical, or if not indigenous, probably sovereign is a better word there. So currently uh, the ADF is investing in its own global high bandwidth satellite communications network, which is awesome. But really, I think we should also invest in imaging satellites. I think that would be a, a great investment as well. Obviously cyber needs to be invested in, but it's already happening. And uh, I guess finally, ground-based long-range anti-ship cruise missile capability as well. Whether that's the Block 5 Tomahawk, which does have uh, an anti-ship variant, that would be handy, or ground-launched LRASM, whatever's available. But I think ground-launched long-range anti-ship missiles. Given Australia's geography, having short-range ground-based missiles like uh, the Naval Strike Missile or the Harpoon really doesn't do all that much for you. You really need something that can reach out uh, into the Indonesian archipelago and beyond. So, you know, that kind of 500 nautical mile range. So that's why I think Tomahawk would actually be a great idea. So that's some investment decisions. You know, there's lots of stuff in, in land power, but there's, there's heaps of stuff that's being, uh, that's being done that's awesome anyway that I wouldn't necessarily change, such as HIMARS, the Apache, um, you know, the new tanks and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, so otherwise I'm not too sure what I would change otherwise. You know, maybe I would increase the size of the surface fleet. So we've got a great question from Swiss Evans. What's up, man? I know uh, you've asked questions before in my other TikTok Q&As, uh, which I haven't done for a year. So it's good to see the old faces around. Were there any battles in Roman history that went so badly for them it made them really change up their tactics and how they fought going forward? So I'd say there are three battles that really come to mind that meet this kind of definition. So I'm thinking Adrianople, Cannae, and uh, Rausio. So uh, I'll talk about Cannae probably because it's the most famous example and it really did lead to a, a rapid and drastic development in Roman tactics. So basically what happened at Cannae was a, a large and very potent and actually pretty well led Roman army was ambushed on an open field by a Punic army under Hannibal, very famous uh, Punic or Carthaginian general. Basically what happened was Hannibal lured Varro's superior Roman army, which had about a uh, two to one force ratio advantage, into attacking in the center and concentrating its infantry force in the center of the line. 
Now, because of the Punic formation, basically this funneled the Romans into the middle, the center of the line. And when the Punic line uh, actually broke, uh, as the Romans pursued the fleeing Carthaginians, they found themselves in an ambush. They were trapped between two columns of uh, elite, heavily armed African spearmen who basically pinched them like they were in a vice. And uh, the Roman formation became compressed, which was uh, one of the worst things that could happen to you in ancient battle. Your formation became compressed, which meant uh, individual soldiers would not have enough room to effectively fight and uh, eventually would crush one another, a bit like a crowd death. So uh, this was an absolute moment of uh, tactical brilliance by a man named Hannibal. Now, there was a guy, a uh, young man who was there. He was only 19, I believe, at the time. His name was Publius Cornelius Scipio. He was the son of a uh, former consul, who a consul is like a Roman president. There were two of them every year. And uh, he was a tribune of the Second Legion. And a tribune was a middle-ranking officer above a centurion. So uh, he survived the battle uh, amazingly. And he would go on to become one of Rome's greatest commanders in all of uh, Roman history. A little bit later, he ended up going to Spain, taking over after his father and uncle were killed fighting uh, the Carthaginians in Spain. Carthage had a massive empire in Spain that was very, very profitable and was really their power base. It was where most of Hannibal's army had come from, very fearsome Spanish uh, tribesmen. And Africanus went there and he developed a, a new way of essentially employing the heavy infantry formations. His new tactics relied on maneuver. So basically the Roman system prior to this uh, utilize something called the three lines. Now, the idea of this was to simply grind down an opposing battle array. The first line would be made up of the Hastati, men in their 20s, and uh, they would engage the enemy first. And right behind them, the second line, arrayed in a checkerboard, a, a formation called the Quincunx, uh, because it resembled the number five on a gaming die, if you can imagine that. So you'd have two uh, units in the front. These units were called maniples. They would have a gap in the line, and behind them would be a unit um, of principes, uh, men in their 30s, that would cover the gap in the front line. And then behind those two, staggered again in that checkerboard formation, would be the triarii. So uh, they were men in their 40s. Now, the idea of this formation, which was developed over uh, centuries of Roman warfare, was to just grind down your opposing battle array. Now, if you can imagine how strenuous and taxing uh, edged weapon combat is, basically you would get tired very quickly from fighting with a shield, an armor, and a sword, or uh, an axe, or another um, ancient weapon. So the idea was to simply grind down your enemy by rotating frontline units. The Hastati would fight first, and then as they became tired, they would be rotated with maniples of principes, and which would allow the Hastati to catch their breath and deal with any wounded soldiers amongst them and regroup and reform while the principes took on the fight. Now, the Hastati and the Principes would rotate, and this would act like a be like a steamroller, would slowly grind down the enemy. And uh, this was very effective. It made Roman frontal assaults very effective. And you had the, uh, you know, the men at the back, the, the Triarii, uh, the most experienced men that you could throw into the battle if you really needed to. Now, Africanus changed this whole script. Basically, you know, Hannibal had exploited the proclivity of Roman commanders to attack in the center using this three-line system, which was very effective, uh, basically by using ambushes. So he would often feign retreats, or for example, at the Trebia, he actually allowed his, well, he didn't allow, his center was simply broken by the Romans. However, on both flanks, light infantry and cavalry basically enveloped the Roman line, crushing the flanks. This was a, you know, this was something, Africanus was there as well. He was with his father actually saved his father from being killed at uh, the river Ticinus. So basically, you know, Hannibal used uh, ambush and envelopment to counter this Roman strength of uh, frontal assault. And, uh, you know, he used this Roman proclivity to attack in the center and smash the center of enemy lines to his advantage, most notably at Cannae, where he launched this, uh, you know, this brilliant ambush in plain sight. Now, Africanus, um, when he ended up being in command of his own armies, saw how much simply attacking in the center really was a Roman weakness and uh, basically used some of the ideas of that he'd been exposed to, some of Hannibal's ideas, but really changed them and uh, developed his own doctrine. So instead of using ambush to achieve envelopments, which is what Hannibal did, Africanus used maneuver. Basically, he would take his legions and march them rapidly around the flanks. And this was devastatingly effective. 
it worked incredibly well at Bayacula, a battle in uh, southern Spain, and then a massive battle at Olipa, which was, there were as many Carthaginians at Olipa, roughly, as there were Romans at Cannae. It was an amazing victory, and again, Africanus was outnumbered about two to one, even more if you account for the amount of uh, unreliable Spaniards that were in his ranks. He defeated that massive army of 70,000 with about 20,000 Italians. So this was devastatingly effective and, uh, you know, it was effective all throughout uh, the campaign, eventually all the way till the end of the war, this new tactical doctrine of using uh, manoeuvre, the manoeuvre of heavy infantry lines rather than frontal assaults. And uh, really, this was the invention of uh, Africanus himself. But yeah, interestingly, this would, um, this really would not be utilised so much by Roman generals after the Second Punic War. A very similar idea would be brought in by Marius during the Cimbric War after uh, the disaster of the Battle of Arausio, where uh, more Romans or you know, Roman allies died than at Cannae. And this would lead to a period of uh, manoeuvre warfare during the first century that would reach its apogee with guys like Caesar and Sulla and Lucullus, who would use the rapid manoeuvre of legions, using the cohort specifically, to devastating effect. So this is one of the reasons why the Roman military was so capable in the first century with a very famous, you know, Caesar's army in Gaul. Utilized maneuver brilliantly, so did Sulla. So yeah, this shift towards maneuver that happened under Africanus and happened also under Gaius Marius, you know, I believe anyway, I would argue, uh, really were both the result of devastating military defeats, once at Cannae and then at the Battle of Arausio as well. So, uh, yeah, this often happens, not just in, you know, Rome, but across military history. One of the greatest catalysts for innovation within a military is failure. Uh, we see that in World War II as well with the Soviets and uh, also the Western Allies. After being defeated by the Germans, we see innovation, we see development. And really, by the end of the war, the Western Allies and the Soviets were more than a match for the Germans because they innovated in response. So yeah, that's probably two of the best examples I'd have. I'd have the Battle of Arausio and the Battle of Cannae. So, uh, Super Mega Rimmer. Dude, too much information. Um, he asked me, what impact do you, I think the change of government in Australia will have on the AUKUS submarine project? So uh, I don't think it will have any impact. Generally speaking, when it comes to national security, the ALP and the Liberal Party have a lot of bipartisan support. So, oh, sorry, a lot of bipartisan positions. This is why when the AUKUS pact was signed, the leader of the opposition, Anthony Albanese, was briefed on the whole thing. And he came out uh, in support of the pact at the time. So yeah, from, from what I heard, he had a really good conversation with Boris Johnson and everything's still on track. Really, you know, historically, with a, a couple of exceptions, the ALP have been a safe pair of hands when it comes to national security. So of the Liberals, to be fair. You know, really, I think there's a lot of bipartisan support when it comes to this big stuff. Uh, you know, we're talking alliances and that kind of thing. So I don't see any major uh, shifts happening to the AUKUS deal under Albanese, none at all. So Spam0601 asks, what is the biggest concern I have for the Royal Navy? It depends on what you mean by concern. You know, basically, if you, if you mean, what do I think is the biggest hole in the RN's capability? I would say it's the Royal Navy's amphibious forces. You know, really having a couple of LPDs is a long way from having a proper LHD. Really, that is a real hole in the RN's capability, in the RN's power projection capability. You've got these really beautiful carriers that are very impressive and you know can deploy quite a potent air group, uh, which will bring me to the funding issue in a second. But you know the ability to project power from the land to the sea is also dependent upon uh, your amphibious capability, and that is uh, lacking quite a bit in the RN. So that is a hole in capability that I see. Uh, in terms of concern, it would just be that well, there obviously are some technical concerns you have to worry about the Dreadnought class. Um, you know, there were some issues with Astute. However, I think people tend to get on uh, the back of navies and naval companies that build things like submarines. Submarines are highly complex machines and sometimes, you know, you get delays and you get cost overruns. But I just hope there's nothing too drastic when it comes to Dreadnought. But yeah, just, just in general that uh, the Royal Navy is adequately funded that really the, the larger force structure plans we've seen that are great and very commendable and something I, I definitely I'm happy to see that the money is, you know, actually put there by London, by Westminster, that it actually happens. 
Finally, one concern might be that Royal Navy ships in general tend to be a little underarmed, especially from the anti-ship cruise missile threats. Obviously, the Type 45s, the Daring class, are armed and very well equipped to uh, you know, manage the air threat. But the Type 23s are not so much. Um, hopefully, that will be improved with uh, you know, the City class once that comes online. So, yeah, that's probably my biggest uh, concern, if I have one. So, JDDDDD4055 uh, asks, Do we know anything about the Generation 6 fighters? Uh, not really, man. Not all that much. Um, you know, I, I think what we understand as Generation 6 is still kind of coalescing. So, one thing we do know about them is they will be manned, or at least they will be both manned and uh, unmanned. You can fly them either way. But really, what we're seeing is, instead of six generation fighters being unmanned, we're seeing manned platforms operating in teams with unmanned aerial systems. So, that will be the future, I, I think, of uh, aerial battle, and also under underwater battle as well, over the you know coming decades. It will not be that uh, robots and drones replace manned fighters or manned platforms. It will be that they will enhance them by acting in a networked team. This is very critical when things like line of sight data links are just so much more robust than satellite data links, which you know people generally rely on to fly things like a Reaper, for example. You know, you use a satellite data link and you fly it from a container back in Las Vegas or something. Well, against a very capable adversary that can target your satellite communications and has a sophisticated electronic warfare capability, that may not be as reliable as you think it is. However, you know, even if communications are lost with a manned platform, that manned platform will go on and uh, achieve its mission. So uh, having local networks where you have a manned fighter or a pair of manned fighters uh, operating in tandem with unmanned uh, aerial vehicles really is the best of both worlds. And I think that will dominate sixth generation warfare, these unmanned manned teams. Now, in terms of the manned platforms themselves, I don't know. Um, I think they'll probably be stealthier they will double down on stealth i would guess that they actually won't be all that maneuverable um, however things like long range super cruise you know very advanced sensors and high speed will all be uh, very critical capabilities it's just hard to know because we don't know what features really will define sixth generation yet i think the, the british tempest fighter they're calling a sixth generation fighter but really, when all you know everything's said and done, we might end up looking back and saying, "No, that was a 5.5 generation fighter. That really was a fifth generation fighter with uh, some improvements." Uh, yeah. Other than that, we'll just have to wait and see. Once the next generation air dominance program produces, well, it already has produced a prototype, but once it actually gets publicly, um, you know, released, once we actually see what it is and what it does, we'll know more about where things are heading in the sixth generation. So, uh, an Aussie perspective on US mass shootings. Do I think it's possible for things to change in the USA in regards to these tragedies? All I can tell you is it, it really breaks my heart to see that on the news. Uh, it really is heartbreaking. I can't think of anything more horrific than a primary school shooting. I don't think it gets more horrific than that. That's as bad as it gets. So. To be straight with you, man, I don't have a good solution. I don't know how the US gets out of this hole that it's in. There's one thing that I think is apparent is that the mass shooting appears to almost be a uniquely American phenomenon these days. Yes, it happens in other places, but just nowhere near to the same extent, not even close. Yeah, I, I think US gun culture certainly has something to do with it. Now, obviously things like mental health have a massive part to play in this um, and the wider culture in general has something to do with it as well. You have to wonder what drives these young men generally to do such unspeakable things as to walk into a primary school and start shooting people. Maybe they're copycats. Uh, you know, maybe they want the notoriety. I don't know, but uh, it's a deeply disturbing phenomenon. Now, people often look to Australia as a, an example of, of a country that effectively dealt with mass shooting. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know, what happened in Australia is a guy walked around a place called Port Arthur, which is a tourist attraction. It's an old penal settlement in Tasmania with an AR-15 and shot 30-odd people. Basically, after that, Australia brought in a, a, quite a wide-ranging set of uh, firearms controls that didn't exactly ban semi-automatic weapons, but made them uh, much harder to own. There are guys in Australia who own AR-15s. You can import them from the US. You have to have a Category D license, which means you need to be a commercial shooter. You need to get paid to 
um, shoot pigs, but this can just be, you know, by someone on uh, you know, your neighbor's property or that kind of thing. So there certainly are a lot of people who still have semi-automatic firearms here, but yeah, it's certainly less than it was prior to uh, the Port Arthur massacre. Now, ever since then, Australia hasn't had a, a large scale mass shooting, not once. So I think the general consensus is these laws were effective. And there still are plenty of shooters in general. You know, for a category A or B license, um, it's not that hard to get. It's basically like a driver's license. You have to have a driver's license. You have to have a gun safe. Um, not a driver's license, a firearm license, sorry, which is like a driver's license. Uh, you have to have a legitimate reason, which just means you need to go to the effort to joining um, to join a shooting club or to getting a permit uh, or a letter saying you're allowed to hunt on someone's land. And uh, that's it. That's basically all you need to get firearms in Australia. So it's not like they're banned, but just those levels of, you know, those hoops you have to go through, those, those checks, I think really go quite a long way to... Uh, deterring people who just want to buy, go down the street and buy a gun to you know, do something terrible like this. It certainly makes it harder. So look, I don't know, but I, I just don't think that that's a realistic possibility for um, the United States that they adopt Australia's gun laws. You know, the, the American gun culture is so different to Australia. It's so different to anywhere else really in the Western world. The firearm, it really is part of the United States' national mythology. You know, the idea of the Minuteman and how important that was in the founding of the very nation itself, one that was really forged in a war of independence, uh, really resonates with many Americans to this day and who still, you know, many Americans still hold the idea of the Minuteman sacred, that really it's the armed citizen who is the ultimate guarantor of both liberty and the defender of the state from uh, external threat. I personally would argue that those ideas, uh, they belong in the 18th century rather than the 21st. Uh, they're not super relevant to today in any way, shape or form. But I also understand that this is a, a critical part of, you know, um, US national identity. So I think these are some of the reasons and the very widespread, uh, you know, love of, of firearms. And, you know, like I like guns. I'm not a hater. I don't hate guns. You know, I watch a lot of gun TV. I like to shoot. I don't own firearms myself, but I probably would. Uh, it's just a little expensive and my wife doesn't like them, but um, I'm certainly not anti-gun. So I can understand why people like them in the United States and like having the toys and, you know, enjoying the AR-15s because they are fun. And, you know, the AKs and everything else you guys get to play with over there. But something has to be done unless the United States as a society, as a culture is simply willing to allow these horrific events to go on some sensible gun control just just moderate gun control you know just maybe a licensing or background checks or something just seems to be a reasonable and rational response to these kinds of tragedies in addition to maybe investing more in mental health although you know it seems like the last the texas shooter uh, had no history of mental health issues so I don't know, man. It, it's just an awful thing. and I, I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, I don't know if a, the Australian solution is uh, realistic in the United States, but I think half of the problem is the two sides of the debate just can't even talk to each other about this. There, there can't be any compromise without communication. So that, I think that would be a great place to start. So Matt Weber asked, if I was the incoming Australian Defence Minister, what would I prioritise for acquisitions and otherwise for the ADF in the first year next five? Uh, I think think you yeah, have already covered that man i'd probably prioritize uh, any ship cruise missile development would be uh the critical most important thing and uh, isr as well so could i go through why the red army was so good i guess you're asking in world war ii there so at the start of the war they certainly were not good they were terrible in fact they were a uh, really a dysfunctional rabble house of a military force they'd been gutted by stalin's purges and the upper echelon of the command apparatus in fact, even the mid echelon of the command apparatus was totally dysfunctional and they got absolutely annihilated. So they certainly weren't good at the start of the war. However, later on in the war, they became much better. As I was talking about before, you know, defeat, military defeat often leads to rapid innovation. And that certainly happened in the Soviets or the Red Army during World War II. The colossal defeats of 1941 really led to the development of a, an operational doctrine that was highly effective by 1944. And led to some of the you know most massive defeats that the German army suffered all throughout the war. So one of the things I think that really distinguished the Red Army of you know 1944 compared to 1941, apart from its just general level of competence, which was you know reasonably good. Although really I think 
below the level of the division all throughout the war they were probably inferior to the germans even quite late in the war but that's the thing the soviet way of war the red army's way of war really didn't emphasize small unit quality in the same way as the germans it emphasized mass now the thing about having mass is and what i mean by mass is achieving material superiority at critical elements of the battlefield is it more than simply having a lot of stuff to do it i think people a mistake people generally make about world war ii is they they basically boil the whole conflict down to a contest of production you know this look at the amount of tanks the soviets produced compare that to the germans oh the soviets were always going to win but this only ever tells part of the story you know just as an example as a thought experiment look at how the soviets performed in the opening phases of barbarossa they got smashed however they had material superiority over the germans at the time especially in things like armored fighting vehicles and tanks massive superiority in the number of tanks yet they still got annihilated so really simply having more stuff is only one small part of the story the what the soviets did that really made them so formidable by the end of the war was they were able to really coordinate their massive forces on a massive scale a gargantuan scale which allowed them to wage war again on a scale that had never been seen in human history you know, we're talking about the coordinated movements of millions of personnel, you know, tens of thousands of tanks across thousand, a thousand mile front. And in order to execute reasonably complex battle plans, which wrong footed the Germans on the scale of multiple army groups, um, you know, by drawing their forces to the, no drawing their reserves to the north of the Carpathian mountains in order to unleash a massive blow in Romania, things like this. Um, massive mass rover plans so their ability to coordinate mass and firepower on a scale that had never been seen before in human history would be the primary way uh, primary reason why the soviets were so good it wasn't just that they had a lot of stuff they learnt how to use it really effectively and this offset german superiority at the you know small or mid unit level or even their technological superiority in a lot of areas so i think this is the real key to soviet success in the war um, was they learned to use their mass effectively it's a bit like uh, to use a jiu-jitsu metaphor i don't know if there's any mma fans out there anyone who's ever done jiu-jitsu you know there are there is a difference between a big guy and a big guy who knows how to use his weight effectively and uh, that's kind of an analogy. A, a big guy who knows how to lean on you, who knows how to wear you down by using their mass. And a big guy who just gasses out and is easy to tap out. There's a m world of difference between those two guys. So uh, yeah, I'd say that's probably what made the Soviets so good was their ability to uh, coordinate mass really was uh, amazing. So W. James asks, do I think the UN and organizations like it will ever be powerful enough to prevent war entirely? Or do we need new solutions for world peace? So no, I don't believe that that would ever be possible, that uh, the UN or an organization that was equivalent would be powerful enough to prevent a war. Basically, you know, the fundamental actor within the international system is the state. Really, all the UN is, is a group of states that, uh, you know, like a community of people in a room who decides things. And uh, really, it's those individual people who are sovereign in their own individual areas. And fundamentally, really all that matters is the national power of those constituent states on something like uh, the Security Council. So really, I think the kind of thing you're, you would need for war to end and uh, I don't think war will end ever, to be honest with you. I think war is a fundamental feature of uh, human civilization, probably not just human civilization, but any civilization. And the reason why that's the case is because all political power fundamentally is based on uh, violence, on the ability to use force. And so when you have different groups of people who have different cultural values and uh, believe in different things, if they have disputes, ultimately, you know, their ability to resolve those disputes will sometimes include force include violence that is uh i think something that's quite intractable now the kind of thing you're talking about here uh, really would have to be a world government where the nation state itself is no longer the primary sovereign actor in the international system that really states have to give up their sovereignty to a much larger body that is a global government now um i don't know if that sounds like a utopia to you or sounds like a hell to you because it really depends on what the quality of that global government is if we just put it to a vote those of us who enjoy you know lives of the secular west would probably be outvoted 
and uh, we'd be living in a uh, religious autocracy of some, one form or another. So uh, yeah, how this would actually work, I don't know. But really, you, as long as you have different states, you will have uh, warfare. But even within that kind of one world government, you know, you would have insurgencies against the government, which is another kind of war anyway. Because no matter what quality that government, that one overarching body had, there will be people who disagree with it. And if you disagree with it vehemently enough, you'll be willing to take up arms. So really, I think war is with us. It will always be with us. It's something we have to manage rather than try and eradicate, I would say. So Nick28322, do I think Kazakhstan will ever pivot to the West? No, I really doubt that would ever happen. Really, I think the only possibility is for uh, Kazakhstan is to be within the Russian sphere of influence or potentially be within a Chinese sphere of influence. Yeah, just, just the geopolitical reality of Central Asia uh, really aligns them one way or the other. And there's a really good question as to whether most of the stands will actually end up in a, a Chinese orbit as uh, money starts to speak over the next few years. But actually being in a Western sphere of influence, joining the EU, well, they couldn't join the EU, I suppose, but I don't know, NATO or something like that, I see that as uh, very, very unlikely, a lot of those Central European republics. But hey, who knows, crazier things have happened. Any recommendations for podcasts or YouTube channels or other resources uh, for getting into learning about geopolitics? So it uh, depends how uh, dorky you want to go. Uh, one good one, it's a podcast, it's called Horns of a Dilemma. Uh, it's run by the Texas National Security Review, which is, I think, the University of Texas in Austin, which has a world-renowned national security department. They publish a lot of excellent research on security affairs. They have a good podcast. It is for geopolitics dorks only but they talk about a lot of interesting things to do with national security and geopolitics so yeah that's probably a good place to start so frank gort one uh what do i make of the gaff uh however it's spelled yeah gaff's fine man i understood what you meant of biden straight out saying the u.s would defend taiwan seems like it's uh it's been ambiguous previously so i don't know whether this was a gaff or this was a deliberate change in policy it depends. I think we shouldn't assume just because it came out of Biden's mouth, it was a gaffe. And by gaffe, I guess that means an accident or whoopsie. Although he has been known to speak off script from time to time. So I don't know. It really depends as to whether this is, uh, you know, a, a well thought out policy position of the United States or whether it's just him talking. Uh, however, it's not crazy given what's happened in, uh, you know, places like Ukraine that we've seen the kind of lengths that authoritarian regimes that are aligned with China will go to uh, achieve their geopolitical aims within their region, that the idea of China doing the same thing to Taiwan probably has never been higher. You know, the threat of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is probably as high in the 2020s as it has been since the 1960s. We're really entering a, a period of very high risk when it comes to a Chinese ta Taiwan war. So now being a time for US policy to shift away from one of ambiguity towards one of being crystal clear about what the US would do does actually make some sense. So look, it does depend on whether old mate was just, uh, you know, um, speaking off, off the cuff a bit, uh, which is certainly something Biden's been known for for years and years and years, not just, uh, you know, lately I remember he, the way he spoke when he was vice president was quite similar. But look, it could actually be a good thing that the US makes its position clear to the Chinese that, you know what? Yes, if you invade Taiwan, we are at war. So that might actually help prevent China from, you know, making that calculation where they may miscalculate and think, well, maybe the Americans aren't really going to defend Taiwan when, uh, you know, the US position all along was, no, we are going to, we were just trying to be ambiguous. So it really depends as to whether that was a gaffe or whether that actually is a well thought out change in uh, the you know, US's policy position when it comes to Taiwan. Which long term possessions of the Roman Empire most resisted adopting a Roman identity? This is probably hard to answer. I mean, look, Rome itself was a multinational, multi ethnic state. So many places around the empire never really took on a purely Roman identity. Most people saw themselves as. Um, you know, their local identity, their local nationality, whether that be, say, uh, from the city, the polis they were from. So um, someone might be an Alexandrian, would see themselves as an Alexandrian, a, pl a proud Alexandrian and a Roman citizen at the same time. So, you know, it's probably not as simple as uh, everyone thought they were Romans as the same way as everyone thinks they're Americans in America today. Um, Roman national identity probably wasn't the same then. 
as uh, you know we might think. However, if I was going to um, you know give it to one area that really resisted Roman rule the most fiercely, I would say it would be the Spanish. Basically, the the Roman presence in Spain began during the Second Punic War, the Hannibalic War, and uh, that was in uh, the second century BC, so the late the latter part of the you know the last decade of uh, two hundred BC. And basically, the Romans were still fighting the Spanish 200 years later. Uh, in the reign of Augustus, there were still wars on the Spanish frontier. The Spanish Empire was a huge security burden on uh, the Roman state. They sent colossal military forces to Spain for years and years and years. And this was a grinding, awful war that just went on for generations. So I would say it was probably the Spanish that fought the fiercest. But yeah, I wouldn't look at Roman national identity quite the same way as it maybe is portrayed in the movies or the way we would understand it today. So I've seen many videos about the retraining of the Ukrainian military from a Soviet style of leadership to a Western style of leadership. Your thoughts? Uh, Yeah, I think that's certainly been something that's been going on uh, since 2014. I think the British especially have had a large scale training mission uh, in Ukraine for yonks, ages. I think they've trained 22,000 or so uh, I might be getting that wrong, but that's my memory, uh, officers and soldiers. So I think a lot of the Ukrainian general staff and even down to you know lower officer level have uh, received Western training. I think, you know, if you look at the way they've conducted battle in, you know, Ukraine, it certainly doesn't look like a Soviet defensive. Um, really, we've seen a lot more subtlety and sophistication in Ukrainian tactics, uh, using a defense in depth strategy, not throwing mass assaults at places, uh, not trying to mobilize every man, woman, and child and throw them into the battle. Those are more typical Soviet, you know, ideas. Again, going back to that concept of mass, uh, really Soviet doctrine really revolved around mass, uh, but, you know, in, in the lands, also in, uh, you know, naval power as well. Having numbers of platforms, having numbers of weapons, and being able to saturate your enemy to overwhelm their defenses was kind of, you know, the Soviet method of war in a nutshell. And so we really haven't seen that from the Ukrainians. We've seen a much more subtle and effective defensive strategy relying on things like maneuver, you know, strategies like defense in depth that really are, you're right, they're more Western. The, they, they do look more like the way a Western military would fight. And I think that actually goes quite a long way to explaining why the Ukrainians have been as effective as they are. They seem to have been quite well led throughout this uh, whole campaign. The defensive strategy seems to have been good. And uh, I'm sure, look, I'm sure a lot of the military contacts between the Ukrainian military and their friends in Europe and North America are happening on a daily basis anyway. And I'm sure they're getting a lot of advice on things like tactical plans. The amount of intelligence sharing that's going on between, say, the United States or NATO in general and Ukraine is uh, vast from what I understand. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if yeah, they're bouncing a lot of ideas off each other. So could I talk about the Soviet air army against the Germans in World War II or suggest any good literature? It's actually a part of the war I don't know quite, I don't know a lot about, to be um, brutally honest with you. It's not something I've ever really looked into. So uh, unfortunately, I, I can't really give you a really good answer on, on that one, Matt. So what changed that allowed the Russians to finally have some success around Severodonetsk? I don't know how you, I, I can't pronounce these Ukrainian towns very well, so I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, how, came, how come Ukraine was not able to hold them off? So there's a couple of things to consider here. Firstly, the main reason they've been able to achieve success is they've been able to achieve sufficient mass across a very narrow front. Basically, they uh, took forces from all over the place and uh, they've concentrated them on a tiny front that's only a few tens of kilometers wide. And that mass has effectively overwhelmed the Ukrainians' defenses in that small area. So this is basically what they've uh, had to do. So but we have to remember, this is a very small area of front that they've attacked across. They've had to pull units from all over the place in order to concentrate them uh, in this area. And I'm sure they're taking very horrific losses in the process of doing so. So I think that's the main reason they were able to achieve sufficient mass over a short enough area of front to overwhelm the Ukrainian defenses. However, uh, it seems as though the thing we have to remember is the costs of this operation may absolutely not be worth the benefits. Really, this is kind of a political objective, this city. It's, it's all about finally being able to say that the Luhansk Oblast uh, has been secured, which really is a, you know, it's some kind of a victory for 
you know, the Russians that Putin can take home. However, if most of the Russian military has been expended in this really brutal battle to take this city, then this is only going to open things up for a Ukrainian counteroffensive a little later on. Basically, the Ukrainians are not committing the same proportion of their forces to the campaign in the Donbass as the Russians are. That's a, a very important thing. So, you know, the Ukrainians are looking much wider at, um, you know, husbanding their forces for a large scale counteroffensive. I'm almost positive of that. The Russians are desperate to achieve a political victory in the Donbass to justify basically what's been going on in this conflict. You know, one of the major stories the Russian government told to its people was that they were going into Ukraine to save the Russian speaking elements in Luhansk and Donetsk. So being able to say they fully have liberated Donetsk, or sorry, Luhansk, is a huge political objective. It's something very important to Vladimir Putin. So really the Russians are, are willing to mass and throw a whole heap of their forces into this cauldron this very vicious battle in Luhansk, where I think from what I've read anyway, you know, this is ISW's opinion that really what the Ukrainians are doing is uh, just feeding the minimal amount of forces in required to try and hold the front together. Uh, they're conducting a mobile defense. Uh, they're using mechanized forces to try and counterattack wherever the Russians seem to be massing. And the fact that they're able to do this really is just, that's due to the fact that the Russians were unable to achieve air superiority because one of the things that air, air superiority gives you, and this is one of the lessons that comes from you know, Normandy in World War II, is it denies uh, mobility to the enemy. It denies the enemy the ability to maneuver, especially by roads. And so the inability of the Russians to gain air superiority has allowed the Ukrainians to conduct this kind of mobile defense, which allows them to uh, maximize the utility of the forces they have available to them in the Donbass. So, you know, really... I wouldn't look too deeply into this victory. You know, what I mean by that is it, it may not actually lead the Russians to anywhere strategically significant. And in fact, they may be grinding down their forces even more in order to achieve a political victory, which may leave them open to a large scale counteroffensive a little bit later on, a little bit like the Battle of Stalingrad with the role reverse there. Now, I'm not saying that the, you know, the, the Russians will be encircled like the Germans were in Stalingrad. Not at all. That's not what I mean. I just mean that one of the reasons why Hitler became obsessed with Stalingrad was he needed a political victory over Stalin. Really, the Volga had been cut already. He didn't need to take the city, but he really focused on it because it would be a political victory. Now, this distorted rational decision-making, rational military decision-making about you know the amount of forces that were being committed to the Battle of Stalingrad and how much the costs were worth it. Now, we may be seeing something similar happen in uh, around the city, I'm not going to try and pronounce it again, where the Russians are throwing everything at this uh, offensive in terrain that favors the defender. They're suffering badly because of it, and really their forces are getting ground down in this offensive. So uh, it may be, even if they achieve a victory here, it may end up being somewhat of a Pyrrhic victory. We'll have to wait and see, though. But um, certainly I've heard arguments to that effect that certainly made a lot of sense to me. So who will be the first new country outside of Europe to join NATO? Tunisia, Colombia, Australia. So this was uh, Jerry Arc 7. So I don't know if there ever will be one, to be honest. I don't know if NATO will ever expand beyond uh, the North Atlantic. There are several countries that have like a privileged partner status with NATO. Uh, Australia is one. So I guess, you know, if... I don't think this is likely, but I guess what we could in theory see, or well, it's not implausible, is an expansion of NATO to include the Western, the Pacific allies. So uh, imagine a NATO that became, um, I don't know, we call it something else, a global, an Atlantic Pacific treaty organization or something that included Japan, Australia, and potentially South Korea. The only reason I would see that as being at all possible is if we saw a full-on alignment between China and Russia, maybe a full-blown military alliance, you know, bringing both of those powers uh, together, meaning that, you know, for the Europeans, any war with Russia would mean a war with China anyway. At that point, the idea of a, you know, a global Western alliance with NATO as the bedrock might make some sense. So if I was going to say that, I, I believe that's quite unlikely, that possibility, but uh, that is at least plausible. If that was going to be the case, I would say it was probably those you know, those, wet, those partner nations like Australia and Japan, that would be uh, front of the list. 
I would I used to include New Zealand in these discussions, but I don't know where the Kiwis stand anymore on China. I don't know if they want neutrality or if they want if they really are all in with the Western allies. Um, so I, I don't know about New Zealand, but I think Australia and Japan uh, certainly would be top of that list. So uh, DY four will be coin coin four. I don't know what that news name says, but uh, the dude with the mad VL turbo by the looks of it in his uh, picture. Hey mate, um, would you? How would you design your ideal ADF? Any uh, change in force structure or size? Uh, what specific systems or uh, vehicles would you have? God, that's a huge question, man. If you want me to have a fantasy ADF, man, I could talk for hours about that. Uh, I would commission a pair of Canberra class LHDs. So I would have four of them. I would fit these out for uh, aviation, whatever is required, because it's very hard to figure out what the camera requires in order to operate fixed wing uh, air power off them. But I would do whatever was required. So very similar to um, the way the Spanish have theirs. And I would buy 36 uh, F-35Bs that would be under the fleet air arm. So that would go to the Royal Australian Navy. And uh, that would give us a, uh, a pretty potent carrier capability, quite comparable to what the Japanese are going to have with the Zumos. That'd be the first thing. Uh, I would increase the size of the surface fleet. So basically, I would immediately start building an additional three Hobart class destroyers for a full run of six, six in the class. Look, basically, the Hobart is uh, it's such a good warship. It's so versatile. It's really excellent in anti-submarine warfare. Uh, it really is an, a, a miniature Ali Burke. You know, we could just, we could have just built 12 Hobart class destroyers and we would have had a very potent surface force. So yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily know why we needed to go down the road with Hunter as well. No, we could have just done six and six, but anyway, I'd have uh, three additional Hobart class uh, destroyers. I would do that ASAP. I would increase, I would reduce the build of Hunters. I would maybe put that off for a little bit to potentially eight. So that would give us a surface fleet of uh, 14 major surface combatants. That should be enough to go around to allow us to deploy a carrier battle group at least. Let's say one carrier battle group and one amphibious a strike group with a, an actual you know, regular LHD within the region whenever and wherever we wanted. So I think that would be uh, definitely how I'd structure the Navy. You know, the submarine force, I think it's just great the way it is. Eight Virginias probably, either Astutes or Virginias are great. So the current force structure is awesome. They just need to happen, need to happen ASAP. What I might do, I don't know, it depends. I, I would really look into leasing a, a couple of 688i improved Los Angeles class nuclear submarines for the interim. It's going to be a long while before we get this Virginia or astute in the water. People are saying 2040, but I don't think that's realistic. I think it'll be quicker than that, maybe 2035, but that's still what, almost 15 years away. So I uh, wouldn't mind getting say three Los Angeles class boats. Look, not that they will be pretty dated by the end of the 2020s, uh, the 688Is, but it will give the ADF quite a lot of experience operating a nuclear submarine before we go down the full on path of having a class of eight boats ourselves. So that's probably what I would do for submarines. Air Force, uh, that's a good question. I really think the B-21 radar would be awesome if we can get a, a squadron of those, say 14. And it depends on what comes out of the next generation air dominance program, which is the um, new fighter that's being developed by the United States Air Force. If we could replace the Super Hornets with that, that would be uh, awesome as well. But it really depends on what's going to come out of that. Uh, Loyal Wingman would go into mass production as soon as possible and I'd buy 200 units. I know this is all sounding pretty fantasy and pretty large scale here, but yeah, I, I really would. I think the whole idea of the Loyal Wingman is if you have two of those for every one fighter, it really gives an air force like the RAAF a large amount of mass that really it's missing otherwise. Because, you know, people are expensive in Australia. Wages are expensive. So unmanned systems make a lot of sense for us. And uh, if we could deploy 300 tactical fighters with 200 of them being drones, loyal wingman that are made in Australia, that makes a whole heap of sense. So uh, I would definitely do that. So in terms of the army, I think it's doing just fine the way it is. Uh, you know, really the only major hole I can see in its capability is wide area air defense, ground-based air defense system. So something like a Patriot or really the more modern Typhon system, which is being developed by the US Army at the moment, which is a ground launch version of the Mark 41 VLS. So the same stuff the Navy uses. So that'll use a ground launched SM6 
that I think is a, a real hole in the army's capability is wide area air defense and ballistic missile defense. So I think that's really the only thing they need. Really, if you were going to increase the size of the army, um, you could add another, you, know, you could raise another brigade and have four uh, active brigades, but that really would uh, mess with the force generation cycle. So right now there's a three year force generation cycle where you have one brigade that's uh, ready for certified for global deployment. You have another brigade that's undergoing intense training to be ready for its year to be certified for global deployment. And then one uh, that's under a reset phase where they're just taking things really easy and uh, people are able to you know, spend time on their individual careers and spend time with their family and that kind of thing. So that really aids in you know, things like uh, sustainment. So adding a fourth brigade would really mess with all of that. So what you could do is actually increase the size of the brigades. So instead of having two infantry battalions and an armored cavalry regiment, have three infantry battalions and increase the size of the armored cavalry regiment to allow you to generate three battle groups per brigade instead of two. That might make sense. But in terms of, you know, platforms and stuff, the new tanks are going to be awesome. And for SCP-3s are about the best tanks in the world or up there with them. You know, artillery, we're getting uh, the high Mars system with its precision strike missile, which has got a 500 nautical mile range. You know, we're bringing in the NASAMS batteries now, which is uh, pretty good short range air defense systems. You know, in terms of small arms, the uh, Australian army is uh, cutting edge apart from pistols for whatever that's worth. You know, I might go with uh, a Glock 17 there or Glock 19. Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of great pistols, polymer framed pistols, whatever the ADF decides to go with to replace the Browning high power will be just fine. But in terms of high end systems, yeah, maybe ground launch Tomahawk is something we should really look at as well. I'll probably invest in that. But we could talk all day about things like cyber and, you know, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance that uh, would be awesome as well. But I, I do think that a stronger Navy and a stronger Air Force are really the cornerstones to Australian security as we are an island nation and really... We, require, we rely on the sea for our security and our prosperity. So those really should be key areas of investment, the Royal Australian Air Force and the Royal Australian Navy, including not just their, you know, the displacement of their vessels in terms of the, the Navy, but the numbers of them as well. So Eaton asks, love your stuff, I guess. How do you see the whole conflict ending? Could this spill into NATO? So I kind of addressed that before, man. I think that uh, this is gonna have to end in a negotiated settlement of one sort or another. It just really depends on Vladimir Putin's domestic political position, I think, as to how that happens. So what do I think about Ray Dalio's conception of history cycles? Are we in one of his transition cycles now? So to be brutally honest with you, I've never been exposed to Ray Dalio's ideas, um, his conception of history cycles. I'm not sure what that is exactly. Are we in, in one of his transition cycles now? Rising power overtakes superpower. So. I don't like the idea of looking for cyclic patterns in history. I think it's a little too simplistic. I'm saying this with the caveat of not actually being exposed to his specific ideas. So take this with a pinch of salt. But really, when we're seeing developments in the international order today, I don't think this can be explained necessarily by deeper cyclical patterns. I generally seem to think that, or tend to think that this really is a, a result of the particular history, the actual history, of the geopolitical system, the international system as it is right now. And that history is unique. So it really is about the particular uh, technological, economic and geopolitical circumstances that the world faces right now. So, you know, reasonably simplistic explanations of, you know, superpower holds its time, you know, has a period of decline, rising power takes over superpower is simply too simplistic to look at our current um, it's too simplistic a way of examining our current historical circumstance i would argue however as i said i haven't had a good look at his ideas maybe they're more sophisticated than they sound on face value but no i wouldn't necessarily see the world as right now we're in a period of transition from one superpower to another we could be but i don't i personally don't believe so Apart from the very basic idea that uh, change is constant throughout history and you know, nations in a position of dominance will not hold that dominance indefinitely, that I can grant. But beyond that, you know, trying to predict where we are right now based on you know, a conception of history, history is going through some kind of cyclic pattern, uh, I just I don't really buy into. But as I said, I haven't really looked at his ideas. So Peter Scro asks, do you have any thoughts or reactions as to the certified UFO, UFO sightings? I think they're called uh, 
unmanned aerial phenomena now uap sightings from military around the world particularly u.s navy potential military impact so this is very interesting i'll be honest ufos and aliens are not something i, I paid a lot of attention to i'm quite a skeptical person generally speaking and i didn't i don't believe most ufo sightings are really um people witnessing or having encounters with aliens however this kind of information um you know this is the kind of evidence that is most convincing to me it's coming from very very serious highly trained people uh, it seems to be quite a lot of them and we're not just talking about people who have seen things we're se we're talking about sensor readings we're talking about radar tracks we're talking about infrared imagery so that's certainly uh, it's information that i take seriously now a lot of these UFO sightings were uh, artifacts or things like balloons or those kinds of things. However, it does seem, given the report that was released to the House Intelligence Committee last week or whenever it was, that there are quite a few that really cannot be explained. And uh, it does appear that these are objects that are operating, especially around uh, US naval formations. Now, one thing I'm very happy about the fact that there are public hearings you know, going on in US Congress is that as far as I understand, there has been a culture of silence when it comes to encounters with uh, strange objects, especially in the air. And uh, that is a toxic culture. So I think a lot of people, whether it be commercial airline pi pilots or naval aviators, if they have a strange encounter in, you know, while they're flying an aircraft, they are worried about speaking up about it because they are worried about you know being ridiculed and also being thought to maybe you know be a little bit funny in the head maybe be hallucinating or something like that and that is just a really toxic culture because not only you know we talk about aliens as the obvious um, implication of these strange objects but they could very well be hypersonic weapons they could be uh, ad, you know adversary drones uh, at least some of them and the fact that really you know that a naval aviator might look out the window and see a strange object and not report it for fear of ridicule and that could end up being a, a chinese drone uh really is something super toxic so i'm very happy to hear that there is now a standard method by which the u.s military reports these sightings and also investigates them so that's excellent you know the million dollar question is could these be aliens i mean i guess it's possible that's a very far reaching conclusion so it's one you really 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 want solid evidence for and i don't personally believe that the current evidence we have is enough to justify belief in the fact that we've been visited by aliens but um there does seem to be some very interesting encounters going on between military aircraft and these objects whatever they are so yeah something super interesting so slog and noggin asked another ancient history question was caesar not prescripting former enemies in error Sulla and Augustus did, and it seems to a degree to keep them safer. So I'll, I'll agree with you, it kept Sulla safer. Uh, Augustus, I'm not sure how much it really helped him. Uh, he, he didn't really do that. He did that during the second triumvirate, really, with Mark Antony. That's when the prescription list really came out. Uh, really, I think what solidified Augustus's place, his political position, was actually you know, how deftly he handled politics in Rome. And really a big part of that was not things like prescription lists, was not acting like a dictator. The whole idea of the Principate really was all about Augustus veiling his power. That's why he was able to rule for such a long time in such a stable manner and why his dictatorial rule was palatable to the Roman aristocracy it was because his dictatorship was veiled. He was only the princeps he was only the leading senator the senators were still senators they still had all their octoritas they still had um you know all of their tradition and uh, really it was the fact that he veiled his power as i've said a couple of times now i had to repeat myself that uh really made his regime stable so had he acted like sulla later on in his reign i don't think it would have been as successful so no i think the prescriptions were were a mistake Plus, they were just bastardly. Sulla was a bastard. He was remembered in history as a bastard. And I really think Caesar was a better human being than Sulla was. Uh, would he have survived? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, maybe he, he wouldn't... Had he, you know, really gone after his enemies in a very terrible way, uh, maybe the guys who actually killed him wouldn't have. But that's not to say that his regime wouldn't have faced larger scale rebellion or revolution uh, from another quarter later on you know he may have faced another general and another civil war in three or four years we, we certainly saw this in later periods of roman history when 
the actual government became unstable, different military governors and different generals ended up being proclaimed emperor or marching on Rome. So we could have seen that again and we would have had another civil war kick off potentially. The thing was, it wasn't just about protecting yourself from being assassinated if you are Caesar or Augustus, or even Sulla to some extent. You had to try and find a political solution. You had to have some way of fixing the government to make it stable to stop another civil war kicking off. And so it, it was questionable as to whether, you know, had uh, Caesar gone after his political enemies, pulled out the prescription lists and had people being murdered in the streets of Rome and brought terror back to the state, whether that would have been a stable solution either. So uh, I'm not sure it necessarily, it probably, look, maybe it saves him from assassination, but he probably didn't even need prescription lists to save him from assassination. How about just a couple of bodyguards? You know, he was walking around Rome in a toga without, he wasn't even armed. And I know that he did that deliberately to show his own confidence, but uh, really a, a Praetorian guard and just some basic personal security could have probably gone a very long way to preserving his, uh, his own security, you know, over and above bringing something as awful as a prescription list back to Rome. So I don't know. I personally think Sulla was a bastard and um, Caesar, it was quite a, an admirable thing the way he treated his defeated enemies, you know. And uh, I, I think the prescription lists in Augustus's uh, career were a black spot, spot, sorry, and something that probably wasn't required. And if you see his most successful period later in his career, things like prescription lists are long gone. And really, he's uh, he's he's forming a relationship with the Senate that is uh, very positive. So Essex asks, how much longer do I think the Russians can sustain the war before they really start to run out of tanks and people, etc.? Uh, so in terms of tanks and people, man, they could keep fighting the war for ages. They have massive stockpiles of uh, very old equipment. And if they mobilize, I mean, in theory, they won't run out of troops, but these really aren't the constraining factors in sustaining the Russian war effort. Uh, they, they very rarely are. Most times people don't lose wars because they run out of people. You know, even the German army in World War II, it wasn't defeated because it ran out of German soldiers. There were millions of German soldiers in the field in 1945. You know, they were defeated because their critical areas were conquered, fundamentally. So I think the Russians, in terms of if they were just willing to sacrifice every last Russian, they could continue fighting for ages. The thing is, it's really political will in wars of choice like this that is the finite resource. And so... Really, the question of sustainment isn't about, well, how many tanks can they send to the front? It's more about how much are the Russian people and Russian elite willing to sacrifice in order to maintain Putin's war of choice. That's the real finite limiting factor. But yeah, if the Russians don't mobilize and they get defeated in uh, you know a large-scale Ukrainian counteroffensive over the coming months, which is possible, we'll have to see how sturdy this regime is. But I'm sure there are many people in the Russian government right now and in the Russian state questioning Vladimir Putin's leadership and wondering whether, you know, really this war was A, a good idea and B, whether they need to remove Putin in order to um, get out of it and, uh, you know, bring back a bit of normality to Russia. So I think that that's the limiting factor in the Russian war effort, political will rather than how many tanks or people they have. Just Google the amount of uh, tanks and armored fighting vehicles they have in storage. It's a ridiculous number. The, the Soviet army was massive, absolutely massive. And they still have all the stuff from back then. So, you know, if, if it was just about putting people in a Russian uni uniform, giving them an AK-74 and uh, putting them in a BTR and sending them off to the front, they could do that for years. But, um, you know, I don't think the Russian state necessarily could handle that in a war of choice like this. We have to remember that even the mighty Soviet Union was almost brought down by the war in Afghanistan. And uh, the Russians have already lost more people in Ukraine than Afghanistan. So uh, yeah, political will is the finite limiting resource. So Thorn89 asks, what would be the minimum number of F-35s the British would need in World War II to defeat the Luftwaffe? Uh, not many, man, maybe a hundred. Um, the thing is, what something like the F-35 allows you to do is penetrate quite deeply into enemy uh, rear areas and strike critical things like command and control and air bases and that kind of thing. Now, the Luftwaffe was a very large thing, but being able to strike Germany from the UK, you know, to albeit at a small scale, but with high levels of precision, uh, would allow you to hit things like uh, fuel refineries, 
you know, with a, a strike package of say six aircraft and do about as much damage as a thousand bomber raid uh, in World War II because you can hit precision targets, you can hit critical elements of the infrastructure with uh, you know, GPS guided bombs and that kind of thing or standoff weapons. So the F-35, if you, especially if you could refuel it, um, you know, refuel it over the North Sea so it would have enough range to penetrate into Germany, it, w- it would be immune from any kind of air defense. So you could strike whatever you want. And the fact that the F-35 has such uh, amazing levels of intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance built into the platform, you know, its sensors are amazing, can identify things at, at night like, uh, you know, fuel depots or... Um, you know, ammunition dumps, bridges, command and control facilities, and strike them at will. So, yeah, probably just a hundred, man. A hundred would do it. Uh, the issue is, you know, the Luftwaffe would come across in um, very large swarms during uh, during the day during the Battle of Britain. That would be a problem for a hundred uh, or so F thirty fives. But an F thirty five can take ten air to air missiles, and you assume all of them would hit, especially the radar guided ones. So, you know, I think it's 12 air to air missiles in the block four configuration because it has six internally and six externally. So, you know, a flight of 24, uh, that's an awful lot of missiles going into uh, a bomber stream. If you can uh, decimate two or three uh, large scale air raids, uh, you'll deter the Luftwaffe from trying to bomb your airfields. So, um, yeah, probably a hundred would do it and they'd probably just defeat the entire Luftwaffe with that. So, uh, Awash asks, how will the support for the Ukraine change based on how long the conflict draws out? Do you think there will, uh, there is a will to support Ukraine over a long period? So, I think, um, there might be some issues with people's appetite for the war amongst the general populace. I think, you know, the real pull of goodwill for the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian military that's felt amongst most Western powers um, you know, amongst average people, that may wane with time. I think one of the amazing things about the Ukraine war is that we're seeing what a real war looks like, a really vicious war, and we're seeing it all the time on our TV screens. You know, the wars we've been used to in our lifetimes, you know, since the fall of the Cold War, they've been dominated by Western militaries that uh, really try very hard to minimize civilian casualties and minimize collateral damage going to extreme lengths often to do so, you know, relying on things like precision guided munitions to uh, strike things with real ac- real accuracy. When the US Army, for example, Western Army is going to a city in urban combat, it doesn't look like, um, you know, Mariupol. But, you know, most of the time in most other parts of the world or parts of history, that's what warfare really does look like. And so I think the fact that we're seeing such shocking images on our TV screens really has galvanized public support for Ukraine. Now, people may get fatigued of that in the coming, you know, if this drags on to December or so, average people may not care as much. Uh, It remains to be seen because it is also, it's it's such a high drama that people really are captivated by it. However, uh, I don't think that necessarily translates to a lack of political support from Ukraine's friends around the world. You know, government policy is swayed by public opinion, obviously, in a democracy, but it's not necessarily driven by it. That's why we have, why it's a representative democracy. The policy of the democracies, especially when it comes to international relations, isn't necessarily driven by the whim of uh, how much people are paying attention to their TVs at any one time. Um, It is guided by uh, kind of deeper and longer principles in general. So I think that the geopolitical imperative to ensure Russia really incurs a strategic defeat which is understood by the national security and political classes of basically all of the major western powers will still be there whether most people are watching their tvs or not in six months so i don't think western support will fade in the major western powers especially not in the uk not not in the french's case uh not in the americans not in the canadians yeah i I don't see that as changing uh anytime soon so, Doc Humanity asks, does the Ukraine war show a tilt back to defense over offense in war, like the US Civil War or First World War, or the end of platform, you know, either tank or ship or jet dominance? Uh, so, no. No to both counts, I would have to say. So, I don't think this shows that we've seen a shift back to uh, the defensive over the offensive being dominant in warfare. Now, one good reason, a good counterexample of this is Iraq 2003. 
really the technological landscape between Iraq 2003 and Ukraine 2022 is not all that different. Uh, that's because of how technologically advanced the American military was at the time. I'd probably still rate uh, the American military in certain areas as still being more advanced than the Russian military in, in 2022, uh, especially if we think of, think of things like network-enabled operations and even uh, the level of precision-guided munitions that were expended and generally air power in general. So what we saw in Iraq 2003 was a devastatingly effective offensive campaign, which essentially cut the country in two and conquered all of Iraq in a month. That was against a, a, a negative force ratio where really seven or so divisions, I'm not, I think it might have even been six because one was caught up in the north, I'll have to go and double check, uh, defeated a force of 21 or so Iraqi divisions, uh, the round numbers there, but roughly had a three to one disadvantage in force ratio. And uh, because of the dominance in the air, um, because of the dominance of the information space and because of the dominance of inter- intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, um, were able to basically cut the Iraqi uh, military to shreds bypass their major defensive positions, cut the country in two, and really fight a, an incredibly uh, impressive uh, offensive campaign. So we see that just 20 years ago where the technology isn't all that different. Now, that would really lead me to really caution anyone from taking a wider, uh, making a wider judgment about the nature of contemporary warfare based on what we've seen in Ukraine. Really in Ukraine, what we've seen is two militaries that are very evenly matched technologically, very evenly matched in terms of forces. You know, the Russian military in general is much stronger, but not the portion of the military that's fighting the Ukrainians at the moment. They have material superiority, but not by all that much. And, um, you know, the the Ukrainians are being helped quite a lot by uh, the West. So I wouldn't necessarily show you know, make wider conclusions about the defense being more effective than the offense at the moment. It's always been a case that defenders have a tactical advantage. That's always the case in warfare. You know, if you hold a good defensive position with cleared lanes of fire on high ground, usually it will take larger numbers of forces to dislodge you. You know, the old three to one rule is uh, often the case, depending on what you're doing. Like if you're doing a uh, amphibious invasion that's generally the, the force ratio you need three to one so that was the case in world war ii and we certainly wouldn't assume that in world war ii the defense had the uh, dominance over the offense so i certainly wouldn't say that's the case now in terms of the end of tank ship jet dominance uh no i wouldn't jump to those conclusions at all either we have to account for the, the peculiarities the particularities of this conflict and these militaries specifically so um, you know, people might say, well, look at the poor performance of the Russian Air Force and the Ukrainian Air Force, really ground-based air defense systems, uh, you know, they have the advantage over aircraft. But we're talking about two countries with a history that come from a Soviet military where the ground-based air defense system was the primary method of uh, defending airspace. That's not the case with Western militaries that are primarily uh, naval and aerospace powers well the united states is anyway and its allies like britain and, the, and australia so really i would refrain from taking making conclusions that would apply to western militaries given what we've seen in uh in ukraine so yeah I, i'm not sure i could say that the tank or the jet fighter is uh, now irrelevant because a lot of them have been blown up you know for example if we look at anti-tank systems you know, people are saying, well, geez, does the javelin mean that the tank is now irrelevant? But infantry has had effective anti-tank weapons ever since the tank has been invented. If you look at how effective uh, anti-tank guns were in World War II, things like the 17-pounder or the legendary German 88 or even the Pac-40, uh, Pac 75mm, they were all extremely effective at killing tanks. Most, uh, I'm you know, pretty sure most tanks in World War II were killed by anti-tank guns rather than other tanks. So, you know, the ability of infantry to kill tanks is not a new phenomenon at all. So, yeah, I, w- I would be careful um, whenever you hear pro- prognostications about the end of the tank or the end of the aircraft or whatever based on what we've seen in Ukraine. So Danny Fordwell uh, asks, is the US military overestimated? Uh, no, uh, I don't think so, especially not in terms of conventional military battle from what we've seen on the conventional side of warfare um you know they fought two large-scale conventional wars in the last 30 years and they've actually they've absolutely smoked their opponent who was you know especially in desert storm everyone talks shit about the iraqis but that's always ex post facto 
really the Iraqi army was massive. It was one of the largest in the world. I think it was the fourth largest in the world in 1991. It was equipped and uh, trained uh, to basically contemporary Soviet standards, used Soviet doctrine and pretty modern Soviet equipment. Not the most modern, but not bad. And uh, got absolutely annihilated. Absolutely annihilated in um, 1991. And again, we saw an even worse annihilation in 1993. So uh, it wasn't the fact that they defeated the Iraqis that was so impressive to everyone. It was the way they were able to maneuver and apply their capabilities that was so impressive. So given all of that data, that battlefield data that we've seen, all of that great history that was being you know, shown um, in all of these, um, you know, these conflicts, and also all of the kind of small unit actions that have taken place in Afghanistan and Iraq over all that time, uh, I would say that the US military is not overestimated. So outside of drone warfare, what do I think the next major advancement in warfare will be? Whether it will be more informational uh, sided or more conventional. So um, I'd have to say, you know, hypersonic weapons are a, a big new thing in warfare. They will definitely will change naval warfare a bit and strike systems. And cyber is a growing domain of, of increasing importance. So we've all heard of cyber attacks, but you know, I, I think over and above just simply simple denial of service attacks and stuff like that. Once things get really sophisticated in the cyberspace and you have different actors that are actively engaging each other in real time, very sophisticated state actors. Uh, yeah, the level of actual combat, quote unquote, that will happen in the cyber domain will be much larger than we've seen thus far, I think. It'll be a very interesting domain of warfare. So Mitchell State said, love to hear about the 1700s Caribbean pirates. Uh, then you've come to the wrong place, man, because I have no idea about the pirates. So can uh, user something, something, something ask, can I list some of the ways that the Ukrainian situation and the Taiwan situation don't fully mirror one another? So they're quite different in terms, like, the tactical problem is quite different. You know, Taiwan is an island. It has a moat. And uh, therefore, the ability of the US to effectively intervene and prevent a Chinese invasion from happening, uh, even just by effectively deploying its submarine forces in uh, China's littorals, um, that alone makes it very different. Really, an invasion of Taiwan would be the largest amphibious operation witnessed in the world since Operation Overlord. So that drastically complicates the tactical picture facing the Chinese in Taiwan. So that's one real critical difference between the two. Uh, I don't think they they mirror. If you mean in some kind of geopolitical, you know, or international relations way, uh, the only difference is that many nations don't recognize Taiwan as independent. But really, in all for all intents and purposes, it is. It is its own country. It just is. So I don't know how much difference there is there. So, uh, Shy Guy Rules OK asked, did I watch the Thug Rose fight? No, I didn't, man. I missed that whole UFC, to be honest. Um, often I don't actually pay for them. And I just ended up consuming UFC media, like, you know, uh, different podcasts and stuff, like, um, I don't know, Morning Combat and stuff like that, uh, Anakin Florian, and, uh, you know, or for Reptile. And if it, the fight sounds awesome, I'll go and download it. Uh, but, yeah, generally I don't, I don't watch them. And I heard that one was an absolute snooze fest. Yeah, sounds like she just didn't put out enough offense to win. But like I said, I haven't seen the fight. So next question. Who's my favorite Napoleonic era general? Any side? Ah, it's Napoleon. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it has to be Napoleon, man. Uh, the whole era is named after him for a reason, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, Napoleon is uh, endlessly fascinating. Um, his career, the battles he led, uh, the way he changed France, the way he changed Europe. Um, yeah, it's got to be Napoleon. So Mincer76 asks, where do I surf? So uh, I surf around here mainly, man, around my home. I live in the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria. So uh, I surf a whole bunch of breaks around here, uh, either the back beaches when they're on or uh, in Western Port Bay or down in Flinders. Uh, yeah, depending. Um, I do love to go to Phillip Island. There's epic surf there. Yeah, I, was, I like Surfies Point. I like Wright Point, uh, Flins Reef as well. Great places. Uh, I did go across to the surf coast and surf bells the other week when it was uh, big it was like eight foot so for anyone who doesn't know how big that is that's like triple overhead so three times as high as i am and uh, when i say i surfed I, I just survived really i paddled out there but i do like the surf coast i don't get over there enough but uh, i love bells it's just such a beautiful place the crowds are a little competitive but it's just gorgeous every time i paddle out there i really feel like i'm in a special you know somewhat spiritual place um Bells just really is amazing. But yeah, I surf Victoria. Um, yeah, the East Coast mainly. 
So uh, JJ Ambrose asks, with the sea air gap so important for Aussie defense, what impact would a Chinese base in the Solomons have on this? So uh, basically the main issue with the a Chinese base in the Solomons would, is it would allow the Chinese to project naval forces uh, across an area of geography that uh, really is critical, as I said before, because it would allow them to potentially interdict the sea lines of communication between the United States and Australia. That's why the Japanese invaded the Solomon Islands in World War II. That's what makes them sensitive to uh, the Alliance in general, but Australia in particular. So um, that's probably the biggest and most important thing, the ability of the Chinese to stage air and naval assets and potentially uh, missile forces within range of you know, Northern Australia, but more critically, their ability to threaten shipping and the sea lines of communication is the biggest reason why. That's a big problem. So uh, Yolo B8 asks, uh, do we truly know the capabilities of any military? It seemed like they would want to keep the good stuff top secret. So uh, for the very high end military capabilities, yes, uh, obviously a lot of stuff is classified, but uh, you would be surprised at how much stuff there is uh, in mili that is produced by any military that is unclassified. That's because really like it's only, you know, high end technical stuff that is kept top secret. Basic things like doctrine, um, they can't, you can't run a military if all that stuff was classified. You know, you, ha you have an organization with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, half the time, you're not really giving anything away by, you know, publishing basic documents on procedures or things like that. So really, it's, it's just much easier to keep only the really sensitive stuff classified. Really, what we're talking about here is stuff called open source material. And there is an awful lot of it, especially when, you know, a lot of military platforms and capabilities, they have to be purchased by representatives in a representative democracy. That means really average people are going to know, want to know why, at least in general terms, they should be spending this much money on an F-35. So we end up knowing, you know, roughly what the F-35's capabilities are. We don't know exactly what they are, we have a pretty good understanding and that's the case across most military platforms so basically you know we can understand an awful lot about a military without knowing the classified stuff obviously that doesn't mean we can understand everything but we can certainly also make ju make judgments on their performance based on real world wars you know things like ukraine looking at what's happened in ukraine has taught us more about the russian military than any analysis done before it and uh, really, it doesn't matter what the Russians keep classified. We can analyze how their systems, their forces actually performed in a real world battle. So uh, maybe a final question here. Does Germany deserve the criticism it is taking for its stance towards Russia, both, both past and present? Uh, partially, yes, I think. But one always has to try and understand where they're coming from. So... You know, it's, I think it's hard for people in the United States or the West in general, you know, the Anglosphere or even, you know, France to a lesser extent, to understand why the Germans are so reticent to be critical of the Russians. But we have to remember the trauma that modern Germany has been through over the last hundred years, that their nation was absolutely destroyed. It was split down the middle by two, you know, two factions of the Cold War, two superpowers and their alliances and was going to be the battleground for World War III, one that was going to be fought with nuclear weapons. Now, that is a, you know, absolutely awful, awful thing that uh, Germany, Germany as, a, as a nation went through. Uh, there's a collective memory there that is highly traumatic. So uh, I think the idea that they're going to go back to some kind of Cold War footing with the Russians is their worst nightmare. And they were willing to do quite a lot to try and uh, have a better relationship with Russia, willing to sacrifice quite a lot. Uh, the last thing they want is uh, to return back to um, that past. So I really think that we have to cut them a little bit of slack for that. But really, I think now you have to be, you know, really delusional to not see the threat that Russia poses to international peace and to European security. And uh, I, I think the Germans, from what I've seen from the Germans, it's generally been pretty good. But I think they really, anything less than essentially what the other major European powers are doing to aid Ukraine deserves criticism, I think. But, you know, we've seen actual German produced weaponry in the hands of Ukrainian soldiers. That's pretty cool. I wouldn't have thought that would even be possible. Uh, we've seen a massive increase in German defense spending. 
And uh, I think there's a commitment to 2% of GDP, which again is something that I thought would have been basically impossible prior to this war. So these are all really positive developments. And uh, we have to, yeah, I think we have to cut the Germans a little bit of slack, but they shouldn't be immune from criticism. This really is a, a, a it's a challenge to global security. And uh, the Germans have a, an increasing role to play in ensuring global security. You know, it's the 21st century now. They are a major democracy, a major democratic power, a major economic power in the EU. They wield a substantial amount of soft power. And uh, really, they need to start you know, use, utilizing their military power for the common good because we need them. So, uh, yeah, we absolutely need Germany in the confrontation to come. So they need to step up. But yeah, hopefully that answers your question. So, all right, guys, it's been quite a while now. So uh, there's a few other questions on here, but I just couldn't get to all of them. I think there's, uh, there's 204 comments on this post and I wasn't going to answer 204 questions. I don't know how many we got through, but we got through a fair few. So anyways, thanks for listening. If you made it all the way through to the end and I'll see you guys either on TikTok or on YouTube. Uh, YouTubers, I'll do one of these for YouTube as well. I might even do a live stream. If you guys want to ask me questions straight up, you can. But thanks for, yeah, getting this far and uh, I'll see you guys around.